Vaim to everybody. It's good to be back on Tuesday, no, Wednesday rather, right? Wednesday, the sixth day of Adar Bet, corresponding to the 13th day of... 13th? 1-3. One, 1-3, three. One, three. yes, thank you. Yeah, that's the same number in English. 13th day of March, 2019. Thank you so much for the warm a welcoming reception. Thank you, thank you, thank you. The live video, thank you. The Lighthouse Video Torah Project live feed, Le'ailui Nishma Devora Fei Gevat Shemuel, and Refuah Shelema of Ora Devora Bad Rifka. The iTorah.com, David Menachem, Refuah Shelema of David Menachem Ben Devora Lea, and Frida Bad Tzivia Sveta. I do know we have more names, but have them in mind for the Refuah Shelema. Anybody interesting in sponsoring any of these classes, let me know. So we give you the cost of the sponsorship and the available dedications. We do know that we have a couple of days already sponsored. That by Ezat Hashem, I will confirm all the names and announce them accordingly tomorrow. The Gemara of today, Gemara Baba Batra, discusses, before we go to that, I'd like to share a very brief thought on the beginning of today's perasha. At the end of the day is perashat Vaikra. We began a new Humash known as also Torat Kohanim. And the perasha begins Vaikra El Moshe. We, Borei Olam, as we all know very well this Pasuk, Borei Olam calls Moshe Rabbeinu, Vaidaber Ela Hashem Elav, Me'ohel Mo'ed Lemor. The reason why the Torah, Rashi explains, Specifically, by the very love, he talked to him, Lema'et et Aharon. That in this particular Pasuk, Bore Olam is conveying the message to Moshe Rabbeinu, and then Moshe Rabbeinu conveys it to Aharon, and Aharon goes on to the rest of the Kohanim and eventually to Am Israel. But I saw, you know, I was praying in Brooklyn in an Ashkenazic synagogue in Borough Park to catch, before I catch the flight. And, you know, there's many shuls like Bnei Yosef in Brooklyn, etc., that they have a lot of minyanim. So I was, I was looking at the schedule, and I noticed that they have minyanim from 5 a.m. till 2 a.m. Shtibadach, correct. Literally 21 hours, 20 hours a day of minyanim. So I was waiting for the minyan to start, and I pick up the book uh, written by a rabbi, who lived, I believe, a generation or two after the Baal Shem Tov. And he says that Rabbi Nahum, it's called, and he writes and it says that this pasuk of today's perasha, Vaikra El Moshe, although in all the pesukim when Borei Olam gave the mizvot to Am Israel were given through Moshe Rabbeinu, but it says that this particular pasuk, when the pasuk says, by the Ber Elav, he says a fascinating Hidush that I never saw it written before. And he says that every time that a person experiences a spiritual awakening, this is called in Torah language, it orerut. The person wakes up to serve Hashem. But it doesn't mean you wake up to come to pray. Because Baruch Hashem, everybody that is here, means I woke up to pray. But it means internally a person feels a bit of heshek, a person feels excitement, a person feels it lahavut, it orerut of avodat Hashem. It says, this is a siman that a kadosh baruch Hu is calling the person. A fascinating hidush that I never saw it before. The Borei Olam is calling the person. And it's up to us what to do with the phone call. You know, sometimes you get a phone call and then you see, do I answer do I send it to voicemail? Do I reject it? You know, somebody just texted me. Uh, literally, before I turn off the phone, can I call you? I need to talk to you. I said, regretfully, I'm in the class now. So I can talk to you after the class. Obviously, I ask if it's a salah. I know it's not a salah call. If it's a salah call, it's a different story. But the bottom line is that it says that a person not let this, uh, it that a person experiences 
that suddenly, okay, it was a one instant of excitement, and then we go back to the old ways. It says the person should seize the moment because Borea Olam is calling him, Me'ohel Mo'el Lemor. Borea Olam is calling the person from the Ohel Mo'el. And I thought it's beautiful to share with the Kahal Kadosh, and this is, doesn't matter who you are. You know, if it's a man or if it's a lady or if it's to do a huge mitzvah or to do a simple mitzvah, at the end of the day, all the mitzvot that we have are different connectors that establish our great connectivity with a Kadosh Baruch Hu. The Gemara of today from Masechet Baba Batra. We know Gemara Baba Batra is a Gemara that deals with the topic of real estate and specifically the topic of Shutafim the topic of partners. And obviously when it comes to partners, you know, some people love partnership, some people don't like partnership. Why? Because sometimes it creates a conflict of interest. You know, somebody asked me the other day, can you make a partnership with a family? I said, depends how much you love your family. <laughs> Literally. You know, relatives, etc. I said sometimes, Unless, you know, maybe a family business that you can be related to, but to suddenly, midlife, to start having a relationship, you need to be willing to exercise self-control. Sometimes walking away is the best recipe. You don't mix business and pleasure, as they say in America, right? Beautiful. Baruch. Atta Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Sheakol Nihiyya Bidbarah. One thing that I noticed yesterday in Brooklyn, I don't usually go to the supermarkets, but I went to check something out, uh, something about a Pesach product, and I noticed that I was checking out that the ladies in the cash register, they don't give the change in your hand. They put it on the counter. Now, why? For senior reasons. Yad le yad lo inake, the Pasuk says. The books of Musar tells us that when a man touches a lady, okay, we're not saying accidentally, you're in the airplane, etc. We're talking about mamash, when you can avoid it, it's the ideal thing to do. So I was very impressed that the cashiers, Goyot, by the way, were trained to put the change on the counter and notice because I was waiting for the line of checkout. And I saw that every time, change on the counter. Why do I bring this up? Because this is the Gemara of today in a certain context, the topic of laundry. The topic of laundry, today's laundry is way different than the way it was many years ago. The Gemara tells us, Leibazot ala kevisa, she'en mistakel benashim besha'a she'omdot ala kevisa. Rashi explains that the ladies, in order to do the laundry, they needed to remove their shoes, and the Gemara is afraid that a man will look at the ankle of a girl. Ankle, or below the knee. The problem is today looking above the knee. That's a problem. I'm getting comments from schools. I'm getting comments from schools that many schools are concerned by the behavior, or I should say not behavior, but by the dress code of mothers. They are concerned, although parents are making great efforts to send the kids to better schools, Torah-oriented schools, but I receive a few comments from principals, and he says, Rabbi, I need to put a mechitza now in the carpool lane. I said, why, are you fanatic? It says, no, but because people of your synagogue are not coming dressed properly, what a Torah-oriented school needs to have. And that is very painful to hear and very embarrassing to hear as well. And obviously, uh, it was said very respectful, I will tell you that. But the message is for the listening audience of our kahal, the men and the ladies, understand that Seni'ut is not going the mikveh night. Seni'ut is a way of life. So here the Gemara is telling you that the hachamim were concerned that a man will see 
below the knee of the lady that is exposed because she's doing laundry. In the olden days, people didn't have washing machines at home. I'm sure some of you may remember doing the laundry by, home, by hand. In the olden days, they used to go to the river, and, right? They used to go to the river and they used to do the laundry by hand. That's why Ezra Sofer, the Gemara writes, in Baba Kama, made a takana that laundry cannot be done on Fridays. Why not? Because if the person will be heavily involved in the manual labor of doing laundry on Friday, what's going to be with the preparations of Shabbat? For everybody's peace of mind, according to the Alaha today, the fact that we have washing machines at home and dryers at home, so the effort to do laundry is definitely much less invasive than the physical effort that it required many, many centuries ago. So that's, I clarify this for the Alaha perspective. The Gemara continues and talks about now the next topic, the garments of the Talmide Hachamim. It says that Hachamim cannot wear short garments. The Gemara in those days talks about wearing a robe. In the olden days, if you look at pictures from Halab, from Baghdad, Egypt, Iran, Morocco, they have a jalebi, so to speak. They have like a big, long coat all the way to the bottom. But the Gemara also says, for Seni'ud, the garments of the Hachamim cannot be transparent. Like a lady garment cannot be transparent for modesty, the garments of the Hachamim cannot be transparent. I'll tell you one thing. We can add the garments of anyone should not be transparent. Because Seni'ud, besides the fact that we are giving emphasis today to the physical aspect of the dress code, but we understand that Seni'ud is privacy, is modesty, a strong connection with Akadosh Baruch Hu. The Gemara, the Gemara brings an interesting concept. How the tables of the Talmideh Hachamim looked. Now, there are different explanations to this Gemara. So I'd like to give you a pirush that I saw written a while back, back in Perashat Teruma. We know Perashat Teruma, and speaking slower because I think the cold weather affected me a bit. Yeah, I feel, I feel it in my throat. The Gemara, the Perashah in Teruma, tells us about the building of the Mishkan that we just finished Perashat Pekudel last weekend. And the Torah gives us measurements. Ve'asu Aaron ase shitim, amataim bahetzi orko, ve'ama bahetzi rohbo, ve'ama bahetzi komato. The Pasuk gives us, thank you so much, halfway measurements for the building of the Mishkan's tape, of the Mishkan's Aaron. The Aaron Kodesh, two and a half by one and a half by one and a half. And one of the commentators asked, why do we say one and a half, one and a half, two and a half? Why don't you make it more a, a rectangular or a square box, full measurements, two, three, one, one, two, three, whatever, but why the halves? Short answer, because once you say half of anything, you understand that something is missing. For example, many times people see the cup half empty or half full. If you are positive, you say half full. If you are negative, you say half empty. If you are a happy person, always positive. If you are grateful, you are happy. If you are not health, if you're not grateful, so then you don't find reasons why to be happy. The way the Gemara discusses exactly, beautiful point. Anyways, so the Torah is teaching us that when it comes to Torah, which is represented by the Arona Kodesh, we never 
we are never complete. In other words, there is always room to grow. What about the table in the Beta Mikdash? The table's measurements were full measurements. And the question is, why? Short answer, the Torah is teaching us, when it comes to materialistic items, be happy with what you have. When it comes to spiritual items, learn how to grow. And now the Gemara says, how the tables of the Talmideh Hachamim looked. You'll be surprised at the answer of the Gemara. Shene Shelishe, two-thirds of the width of the area where people sit, Gedil, they used to have a tablecloth. For what purpose? In order to put the food on the tablecloth, but use the sides of the tablecloth as a napkin. You have to understand, 2,000 years ago, <coughs> excuse me, 2,000 years ago, the way people live and the way we live today is different. You go to a Jewish home on Shabbat, you have, what do you have? You have the plate underneath, right? How do you call this platter? Charger, charger thank you. That was the word I was looking for. You have the charger, you have the meat dinner, dinner plate, fish plate, salad plate, forks for the fish, fork for meat. You have two on to the left, two to the right, a placemat sometimes, and you have a cup on the right. Baruch Hashem, that's a way, and cup for wine and cup for water. Has shalom, you use the same cup. Could be an avon, right, has shalom. I know, for the hachamim of the wine, it is an avon, but for me, it's okay. But those who know how to set up a table, that's how they set up the table. They have napkins with a ring holder, right? Beautiful. And everything must match, obviously. But in the olden days, they used the tablecloth as a napkin. And the Gemara continues. And the third, ve'alav ke'arot ve'yerek. They used to put there in the corner, like a buffet station, separated from wherever the people ate. If people were sitting here, the food was on that corner. For what purpose? So the food can remain clean and proper for the benefit of the guests. And we don't do double dipping when you take food from a tray. You don't take a, a spoon, take the hina, eat it, and put the spoon back. That's called in English double dipping. Right? Beta ba'ato. And it says the concept of they used to have a ring, so to speak, outside of the table. For what purpose? They used to install certain hooks in order to hang some of the utensils for the sauda. I know that to most of us, you know, usually people today have counters, countertops, right? and you have kitchen closets, kitchen cabinets, and you have sliding doors, and you have pull-out drawers, etc. So today, Baruch Hashem, we live in a very, how can I say this, very elegant and sophisticated way of life. But in the olden days, in the olden days, they managed and they had many, many things that today don't make any sense at all. But the Gemara's idea is trying to highlight what was the actions of the hachamim? To eat with the recheres, to eat, interesting enough, to have shoes. Now, shoes, shoes, today, it's common. Everybody wears shoes. And it's easy for a person to own more than one pair of shoes. And if you cannot afford an expensive one or a good quality one, people buy cheaper shoes. Today, today, to look presentable and clean is not very expensive. But in the olden days, to wear shoes, it was a great sign of achievement and accomplishment in life. That's the reason why our rabbis established the Beracha in Birkot Shahar that says, She'asa li kol sorchi that Hashem provided all my needs. 
and that's it. There is a machloket in the halacha. In the day of Tisha Av, do we say this beracha or not? Depends who you ask. According to the Syrian tradition, and according to the Benishai and others, we don't say in Tisha Av this blessing or in Yom Kippur. According to Hacham Obadiah Yosef, Alav Shalom, he says today to say in Kippur and Tisha Av this beracha. The Syrian tradition is not to say, but I'm only sharing the idea behind this halacha. Why Hacham Obadiah Yosef says that you should say the beracha? Because today, shoes are very affordable. In the olden days, to have shoes were a sign of greatness and wealth. Okay? Nowadays, everybody wears shoes. Yes, there could be some countries far away from here, especially places of huge poverty, that perhaps people walk barefooted. But overall, civilization wears shoes. Now, and therefore, Hakam Abadiya Yosef writes, and it says that when we say today in the Birkota Shahar, She Asa Li Kol Sorhi, it is a general blessing that Hashem provided all the needs that I have. I need garments, I need food, I need health, I need parnasa. That's basically what the Shasali Kol Sorhi covers. And all my needs, I only gave you. I only gave you a few examples. Everybody has needs, and Baruch Hashem, Bore Olam, fulfills them accordingly. Let's go quickly. <coughs> Sorry. Oh, repeat that again. Yes. Wow. Everybody was barefooted. Wow. Okay, so now he's going back only eight, ten years ago. Eighty years. Uh, eighty years ago. Oh, eighty. I thought you said eight. <laughs> eight, uh, eight years. Okay, you're young. You're young. Okay, eighty years ago, when Borat Yosef, amen, he saw people walking. 80% of the population walking barefooted, and those who had shoes had canvases. Alpargata, yes, that's the name in Spanish, correct, Alpargata. Unbelievable. So you know what? When you hear these kind of things, you know, it, it gives us an opportunity to be grateful to Akadosh Baruch Hu. Look what's happening in Venezuela. They have no electricity already for a week. So, no water. Somebody was telling me that now they're doing surgery using the flashlights of the cell phones. Oh, my God. Can you imagine that? So I ask a simple question. How do you handle when they run out of battery? Right. They have generators. But that's how long can that last? There is no, there is no water and there is no electricity. You know what that means? Total chaos. I believe that soon we're going to have good news. I don't know how soon will that be. I'm not a Navi. But it, it reaches a point that, you know, you need to say the Yenu. You need to say that even the petrol is not running. There is over 20 boats, 20 merchant ships waiting, waiting to collect the barrels, 285,000 barrels a day. I don't even understand what that means. I just saw it in the airplane yesterday reading and he said I mean two hours away from here two and a half hours the new one the airlines are not allowing their pilots and stewardess to sleep in Caracas overnight go to the Dominican Republic drop the passengers and leave because we cannot guarantee your safety this is very scary there are a few thousand Yehudim still, like 5,000 out of 30,000. Yes. You understand? So, Ba'ezat Hashem, we hope that Borei Olam has 
great uh, rahamim and mercy upon all of us. Amen. Okay? Uh, today, with your permission, I will keep this class short. I have to take care of a couple of matters pending, some of them serious. So, Bezat Hashem, we'll see each other tomorrow. I feel better. I have a better night's sleep. I slept very little last night, but Bezat Hashem, I'm happy to be back. Baruch Adonai